Hi everybody, I'm Frank Clifford and welcome to another Frank Answers presented by Astrology Hub. Great to be back and it's great to be answering all of your questions, as many as I can. Um, I have seven questions that I'm going to try and group into one answer today. So um, I'll be able to hopefully answer more of your questions in the weeks to come. Um, and it's about uh, combustion. It's about fall. It's about detriment. And some of you will know my opinion on these things. Now, um, first of all, I don't pay much attention to a planet's condition in a sign in terms of those judgments. And I'm always saying that every placement has a spectrum of possibility. So if you've got Venus in so-called detriment or Mercury combust the sun, um, they're all doing a particular job. When you have a planet in a sign that it understands like the sun in Leo or the moon in Cancer, it doesn't make it stronger, better, more equipped, but it's doing what it says on the tin. That's how I see it. So the sun has a resonance with Leo. They're both about creative, uh, very creative um, and fertile creativity, developing uh, one's identity. They're both linked to that quest to understand how they can contribute individually to the world, that sense of personal vocation, calling. Um, the moon has a link to cancer. They're both linked to caring and understanding the process of bringing people together, the process of the importance of family, the importance of the past. So when you have a planet in a sign that resonates, what we call maybe rulership, or it's in a house that it's related to in some way, like Mars is related to the first house and the eighth house. Some astrologers don't like to make that, that connection, of course, but whatever you're doing to make connections, which is what we astrologers do all the time, be careful of stopping at that judgment, because usually these judgments have a very uh, negative sound to them. You know, there's no heart, there's no room for creativity. And we are creative astrologers. We're there to help people un identify, understand who they are, get in touch with where they're going, what they want to be. Um, and it's a creative process between astrologer and client. And in, and in the middle of that is the cosmos, and we are the translators. And if we simply stop with a consultation by saying, oh, well, your Venus is retrograde or it's in detriment and then we pull a face <laughs> or we have a, a negative attitude to that we're not doing any good to the client they start they walk away either thinking that astrology is nonsense or it's not being practiced well or they go away thinking there's something wrong with them and usually the things that are in detriment in the chart we've got a sensitive attitude to anyway and we thought, ah, that's the reason why X, Y, and Z. Yeah? And we'll see this in some of the questions in a moment. So what we're doing is feeding into people's insecurities or um, obsessions or upsets. And the key always is to find the positive qualities of the chart, not to ignore the challenging aspects by any means, but to look at the challenging parts of the chart with a positivity of moving forward, making the most of it. And this is what I'm doing with Astrology Hub in reframing the zodiac, reframing the planets uh, in that series of, of um, that I'm, I'm working on this year. Because there are so many ways that we can tell ourselves negative stories or tell our clients things that we think are simple, um, the truth, because we read it from some ancient book or some astrologer that we that we respect um, or don't know about, or we feed into the negativity of that. So I want to address that looking at uh, one chart today, but let's um, let's just answer, see what these questions sound like. So Renya asked, how do you interpret a chart in which nine out of the 10 planets are in houses? whose lords, the rulers, are fallen in detriment or combust. 
Okay, so already we're the, that the framework, the language, the vocabulary there um, that you've learned about that is immediately negative, you know, um, combust, fallen, detriment, all of that. And you know what? I discard that. And I think, what is this house about? What job can that planet do in that sign or in that house? Um, I was working with a client just yesterday about an aspect in their chart that was a square, and it's the most invigorating part of their chart. It's the most active, productive part of their chart. And they said, but it's a square, and I was told it was difficult. Yes, squares are challenging. Sometimes planets are in detriment, meaning they're in unfamiliar territory. They've got different work to do. The example I always use is Mars in Libra. I would really need a Mars in Libra to help me end a dispute because Mars in Libra has an objectivity, an ability to stand back and help both sides reach an agreement. Some of the great states people of all time or the people who worked very decisively in times of war had Mars in Libra, for instance. And that's what you need. You don't need a hot-headed Mars when things need to be resolved. Yeah. I always joke, you know, if you want to start a war, we get a Mars in Aries to throw the first punch. <laughs> if you want to end it where everything is devastated in the middle of the night and nobody knows who's done it, and the enemy has just been destroyed and nobody understands who, get a Mars in Scorpio to go in and, and sort that out. But we need a Mars in Libra, which is said to be in a difficult or weak placement. Don't believe any of that. We need a Mars in Libra when it comes to doing activity with Mars that resolves conflict, not starts it. Yeah? This is why Mars in Libra is said to be in a difficult position, because Mars is gung-ho, jump straight into things. And Libra says, OK, let's be diplomatic about it. Let's consider the other person. How can I make you happy? How can you be happy? How can we bring you together? This is why they're in foreign territory, some of these placements, but they're not weak. Fallen, detriment, combust, all these things um, really don't apply to natal charts. On a simple level, when you're electing or when you're dealing with horary, you're dealing with questions. Who's going to win this lawsuit? We're going to look at this side and that side and see which is most naturally attuned to winning or most naturally able in their signs. That's very simple because it's about a lawsuit. It's not about a person that's lived 40, 50, 60 years on this earth and they've learned to work with all their placements, good and bad, extremes of how they can uh, operate those placements so that's something i really want to get across electional as well okay we're going to elect uh, for a particular moment a particular launch of a project we're going to pick i did an election the other day for um somebody wanting to start a youtube channel and picked a moment where that spoke of it where it's going to be easy we're not going to pick a moment that's chock-a-block with challenges because we want things to flow quickly with a project like that. But with a natal chart, with a birth chart, we have a lifetime to work with our aspects. So rather than feel like I've overcome my chart, <laughs> which makes me want to scratch my head and think, what? You know, you, you, I, I believe we select our charts or at least, you know, we sign up to do the work and our chart reflects that. Um, our birth chart reflects what we've signed up to do in this lifetime. That's my feeling about it. Um, how could you overcome it? What we want to do is we want to use every part of our charts in every way possible. And sometimes it will be negative. Sometimes it will, hopefully, more times it will be positive and constructive. So that question is always fascinating to me. That was from um, Renya. Uh, how do you interpret a chart? I just start with usually the sun, moon, ascendant, planets on the angles, start with looking at that. And I don't worry about fall, detriment, um, combustion, uh, exhortation, rulership. I'm looking at each one of those positions and how that can be used 
positively and the pitfalls to avoid of things that could be problematic with those placements too. And I'm in dialogue with the person. You soon get an idea of how that person is using their chart. So you listen out rather than making judgments. And we all make that mistake when we look at a chart before we meet the person, we think we're going to see X, Y, and Z. And they're very different from that. And in fact, Sometimes you look at a chart and you think, oh, they've got a very impulsive attitude to relationships. And the person comes in and they said, yeah, that was me when I was in my 20s. Now I don't do that. You know, they're doing, they're using that placement in a different way. And the birth chart, just like each one of us, is always about a process of using things to a greater extent, to a higher extent, to an extent that feels more authentic, more positive, more creative in a positive way, of course. So that was the first one from Renya. And the second one, Basil asked, does my debilitated retrograde combust Venus really mean I will have little pleasure or wealth? No, it doesn't. The, the great thing that you can do, Basil, or anybody, is to go onto astrodatabank.com, which is about 30,000 birth records uh, and birth charts with, with times, and you can look at charts. Pick charts that are accurate, that have got A or AA ratings. You don't want to be looking at charts that the year or the time is in question. But take a look at some charts of people that you have, you've admired, and you'll see how they've used that birth chart. And you'll see many people, you can do even searches on some programs. I know Solify, you can do a search on, uh, on people who have got different placements. Have a look at people who've got similar placements, things that you think are debilitating or problematic. And you'll get many examples of people using those very constructively. Of course, there are lots of serial killers on Astro Data Bank and people who haven't used their chart, their wonderful placements, so-called exalted positions, and they've used them to, to make very negative choices and take very negative actions. Of course, this is the personal choice we have in our lifetime. So Basil says, you know, I'm an acupuncturist since I've entered the field. Um, I'm doing very, very well. Um, please, can you help me understand what I'm missing? Well, you're missing uh, this idea that this, the terminology that we use is problematic. The terminology, and I've been working hard, particularly in, in the rise of an interest in a lot of the old texts and interest in a lot of the old methods, things that have been buried, sometimes maybe rightly so, who knows, um, the, a lot of the things that have come up in the last uh, 10, 20 years, um, there's always, always an interest in history, and that's fabulous, and that uh, enriches our understanding. But we live in a very different world with a different viewpoint from what it might have been six, eight hundred years ago in a particular part of the world. And you've got to realize, as when you're reading anybody's book, where they're coming from, what their view of the world was, what part of history uh, that they, they originated from. Yeah. And so when we hear those terms, they come from a particular, uh, particular viewpoint, a particular time in history. Just regurgitating these and sending them out and saying, you've got this and you've got that. Um, great for you, you know, Basil, that you're doing well. And it's not corresponding with the so-called negativity of that. You know? I remember being um, invited to Turkey many years ago and the presenter turned around as, as he was introducing me and said, oh, Frank has a debilitated this, this, and this, and this. And, you know, his Venus is, is basically screwed. <laughs> and I looked with amazement. I thought, I love my Venus. I've got Venus and Aries in the 11th house. And I have the most amazing women friends, Venus, often, you know, and I have the most dynamic people in my life, Venus in the 11th, in Aries. And um, I couldn't help but think, Wow, you know, I, I live my life with people who are very charming. I try to be charming. And somebody who's introducing me has no charm <laughs> and is uh, and acting like I'm some sort of Venusian pariah. So that was always a, a great awakening to how the mindset 
of these terms in astrology can really close people off to see the possibilities. And you're a great example. Thank you, Basil, for, for, um, for mentioning how well you're doing, how life is great. You've got, you're, you're married to a lovely man, takes care of you. You're living your chart in a, in a beautiful way. So ignore what you're missing. Well, you're not missing anything. Ignore these terms that don't speak beyond a simple good bad classification that's what i would say okay let's move on we have another okay yes margarita says does a venus combust mean that means i um does it mean i'm doomed and again uh it doesn't it really doesn't when venus is combust it means it's quite close to the sun by degree and people with sun venus often have unusual relationships or they have they find their way in their own way uh it takes time sometimes for that to happen and sun venus people you know the center of their lives the sun is so linked to venus and that sometimes can be people pleasing other times it can be really the great understanding of people and life and unions and relationship and understanding the importance of that yeah. So the center, the core of the light, the sun, if it's next to Venus, it doesn't overshadow it. Venus doesn't disappear. It might not be viewed up in the sky, but sun Venus is very much about the core. At the core, you're a uniter. You're a bridge builder, somebody that brings people together. And you can do that in a positive way. You can choose to do that in a whole range of ways, depending on the sign, etc. But you're certainly not doomed. So again, uh, distance yourself if you can from that classification. Uh, Natalie asks, what exactly are planets considered to be conjunct? Um, astrologers will say about eight degrees, uh, eight to 10 degrees for a conjunction. Some astrologers say six degrees. The thing is, have a look. The more charts you study, the more you'll be able to say, okay, I can see that in the person, even if it's seven degrees. Those of you who know that I do solo art directions will know that even nine or 10 degrees apart, they come together at that age. If they're nine degrees apart, they come together around the age of nine. And you'll see that in the person's life early on in their lives anyway. Um, and Natalie says, what do you think about planets being combust with the sun? Well, you know a little bit about what I feel already uh, rather, than just, um, rather than just conjunct. Okay, well, combustion, uh, is um, it's conjunct, uh, it's Kasimi, you might be thinking of where it's at the heart of the sun, where they're very, very, very close. So if they're conjunct within eight degrees, they're combust. Do you think that the sun diminishes aspects of a planet it conjuncts? No, I don't think. I think, as we'll see in a moment with a chart, when a planet is conjunct the sun, it brings that message to the sun and part of your vocation, your calling. It becomes very much part of what you're here to do. Uh, that planet isn't diminished. You just, again, you have to look on Astro Data Bank or anywhere to see how many people with the sun conjunct a planet are incredibly dynamic with that planet. It's part of their life force, part of their energy. It doesn't get hidden. I just don't see that. Um, and ultimately, the true test of astrology is not in what the ancients said. It's in what you see in front of you with the client or what you view on, on, te on TV when you're looking at people's charts and watching them being interviewed, etc. cetera. Um, do you think that if a planet is super close to the sun within a degree, it's actually Kazemi being the planets, a kind of mega version of themselves? Um, no, I don't think Kazemi particularly um, enhances that either. Um, so that's my, my take on that. And finally, let's come back to Ellen. I'm going to share Ellen's chart in a moment. Here we are. My sun is conjunct or combust Pluto and Leo at the midheaven. What does it mean when your sun is combust, a powerful, impersonal planet like Pluto, Uranus or Neptune? Having a sun in Leo is already strong. What it well, I don't believe it's strong. It means sun in Leo means it's doing a job it knows. It's doing what it says on the tin. It's an automatic connection and resonance. Um, okay, not to mention cozying up to Pluto. So let's take a look at Ellen's chart for a moment. I'm just going to share the screen. 
All right, so this is Ellen's chart. Here we go, and the sun here is up, up on the midheaven, as we can see, and it's conjunct Pluto, about four degrees, three and a half degrees apart. So Pluto is at 28, and the sun in the midheaven at 24, Leo. And they're both square to Saturn. So Ellen was born at a time in the mid-50s where Saturn was in Scorpio and square to Pluto in Leo. And that's a very powerful uh, signature that I've seen, obviously, a lot in clients over the years and in a lot of people that do some powerful, transformative work. So the Sun Pluto, well, think about the Sun as being the great illuminator and Pluto is the great um, underworld. <laughs> the god of the underworld, of the darkness. So in many ways, part of what Ellen's journey, the sun, her calling, her vocation, is to bring to light a lot of the Pluto issues. Yeah. Outer planets, there's a hierarchy. The inner planets talk more about their placements, their sign placements talk more about our personal journey, our characteristics, those sorts of things. The outer planets the further out you go, they, they tend to influence when they aspect, when we have planetary combinations. So Sun Pluto, it's the Sun that is becoming very Plutonic. So the journey of the Sun, the vocation of that Sun in Leo, of shining a light on things, being supremely uh, creative, developing, the journey is, is to develop one's confidence to develop one's um, sense of identity and how it can be powerfully creative in a way. It's going to be molded, shaped, plutoed. So the Sun Pluto people are the great healers. They're the transformers. They go into situations where they deal with powerful dynamics, political dynamics between people. Sun Pluto people go into areas of life that other people would be fearful of would run away from. I've got Sun Pluto, clients of mine who work in prisons. Most of us wouldn't dream of working in a prison because it just feels like beyond stress and working, you know, dealing with situations that could be quite dangerous. Sun Pluto people are attracted to places that force them to grow, to have a metamorphosis. Sun Pluto people, particularly in Leo, sometimes have to grow from dominating parents, bullies, and grow into their own person and become a mentor away from that powerful influence or bullying influence of the parents or early relationship choices. So maybe Ellen's journey has also been about creating her confidence away from people who have wanted to shall we say for a better term, own her power in that way. Yeah. So the journey of the sun conjunct Pluto is one of a, a transformer, of an alchemist, somebody that is uh, here to really turn from the chrysalis to the butterfly, to, to gain in confidence and power, and hopefully to be able to shine a light on the areas of life that a lot of us uh, feel shame about or are fearful of. And some Pluto people have great courage and ability to say, okay, I'm going to do it, even if it kills me. But we know what doesn't kill us changes us and makes us more powerful. And that's what the Sun Pluto person is about. I'll do it, and therefore I will transform. So I hope that helps in, in seeing that. The Pluto with the Sun is a very powerful aspect. The square to Saturn brings its own challenges as well. A fear of going deep sometimes, a fear of, of really looking at the whole spectrum of who you are, good, bad, and the ugly, you know, all the different qualities there. I hope that helps. I hope that's an insight into how I see some of these very ancient terms. Save them for elections, save them for horrories. With people, there's think of it as a kaleidoscope of possibility or a rainbow or an arsenal of many, many different traits and qualities and not to be stuck with certain terminology that, in my opinion, doesn't really fit into today's world and into what we need and how we can help each other. Okay, that's all for now. I will see you all very soon. Take care.